Okay. <coughs> Okay, good, good afternoon everyone. So I'm Lawrence, I'm the founder and director of Tree Cutting Group. So today I will share about the navigating the new normal, uh, how to strengthen your cash flow and access to the capital. So here is just a brief introduction about myself, which you can see in the slide. So currently I'm a chartered accountant in Singapore and Malaysia. So you may connect my LinkedIn for more information, which you can see in the slide. So Lawrence Chai, 3 CPA. So at 3 Accounting, uh, is our mission to offer the 3E, efficiency, effectiveness, and economy is being a one-stop solution center for our clients. So established in the year of 2011 in Singapore, we have since expanded our office to Malaysia and Hong Kong. So as you can see, uh, in 2014, we ventured to Malaysia and Hong Kong in 2020. So we have also formed a global accounting network spending across more than 80 countries today including like Australia, uh, uh, Europe, and, and even South America, et cetera. So our vision is to be the world leading corporate service provider. So Tree Accounting provides a comprehensive range of services support so that our client can focus on running their business and this includes accounting, tax, secretary, and many more. So for today's agenda, I will be discussing on the overview of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thereafter, I will be uh, providing five strategies on how to strengthen the cash flow during the COVID-19 pandemic. Lastly, I will be ending off this presentation by highlighting the key point of cash flow management and its significance. So without further delay, let us begin on the overview of COVID-19 pandemic. So we are now almost nine months into the COVID-19 pandemic. In Singapore, the circuit breaker measure which were necessary to stem the community spread of COVID-19 and save life. So it do have a negative impact on the economy, in particular the closure of most physical workplace uh, premises from 7 April to 1st June, which have affected the business that could not operate remotely from home. It's estimated to have reduced the Singapore annual real GDP by about 2.2%. So COVID-19 started as a health crisis, which quickly evolved into a global financial crisis at the speed and magnitude we have not seen in our lifetime. So this outbreak is definitely posing challenges to business due to the uncertainty in terms of duration and the extent of the pandemic. So as in any financial crisis, the impact is going to vary based on the different business sector as well as each company characteristic, such as the degree of previous indebtedness, geographical diversification, clients or supplier dependency, size, as well as cost flexibility. So depending on the industry, many companies will see a lower revenue resulting in a less cash flow along with a delayed receivable collection Companies should expect to be on an alert in managing inventory given the uncertainty in the supply chain, which will also place demand on working capital. So sectors that have been the most severely affected are those that rely on international travel, including the air transport, accommodation, and other tourist-related sectors. Consumer facing sectors such as retail and food services have also been badly affected by the cutback in the domestic consumption amidst progressively stricter safe distancing measures. At the same time, outward oriented sectors like manufacturing and wholesale trade have been affected by the fall in the external demand and supply chain disruption. While sectors like construction and real estate have been affected by negative spillover arising from the downturn in the economy. So, however, there are also a bright spot in the economy, which the like a rise in the demand for the online sales and services. So, with the changing business environment, business owners should be ready to take mitigating action. Business structure may have to be adapt, debt may have to be restructured, investment plan may have to be altered, and supply chain may have to be modified. So, businesses need to adapt by prioritize their cash flow management over a longer term business goal. And this means that businesses will need to analyze their cash generating activities and the cash outflow for that and determine their next course of action. 
So I came across this Singapore survey recently in the straight time. Finance professionals say Singapore firms face cash flow problem from COVID-19 demand hit. So cash flow is definitely a critical area that business should focus on. So in trouble time, even the most profitable business can quickly become unsustainable if the cash control are weak and the visibility over cash is limited. So financial institutions may adopt a stricter condition for funding, robust and sustainable crisis cash management, uh, buy variables, breathing space to restructure or refinance. So in the longer run, an improved cash flow can reduce the debt and fund growth and provide a better stakeholder return as well. So in a crisis like COVID-19, getting visibility and control over your cash flow and working capital are fundamental. So there are steps that businesses can take to gain time to stabilize, example, using the cash flow forecast for the next 12 months to assess the current situation, regular variances and analysis of the actual versus the forecast cash flow should be carried out with variances robustly challenged. Consider working capital needs in the context of overall business requirement for the weeks ahead. Review all other non-trading contracts or commitment that have a cash requirement over the months ahead and reconsider whether they are really necessary. So next, in order to strengthen the cash flow of your business, there are strategies which can be implemented to existing business processes. Today, I will share five strategies with you. So first one is to invoice early through the digital means and chase payment. Some businesses do their invoicing once a month and that does not make sense because invoices are typically paid late. So when you are slow in sending them and your customer are slow paying them, so it's a bad combination and never put invoicing off. Whenever you do, you are pushing back your payday. So speed up the process by using template, sending invoices electronically and even invoicing from your phone. So apart from sending PDF invoices manually via email, an efficient way would be to use the electronic invoicing, e-invoicing. So e-invoicing is referred to sending an invoice digitally between the accounting system by business supplier and buyer internationally over a secure network uh, platform. So such invoices are delivered instantly and directly to the accounting system ready to be approved and paid. So invoices are prevented from getting lost in email. Do not be afraid to chase payment. Do not wait until an invoice is two weeks late before reminding a client on the outstanding payment. So try sending a friendly email as the due date approach. Follow up again if they go past the due date. So if you don't have a time for all the follow up, consider using a software that can automate the sending of reminder email for you. If clients do not respond to email, pick up the phone and call the client straight away. So the second is cost optimization and cost control. Without closely monitoring your business spending, you may overspend and run into cash flow issue. Some of the cost control measures you can implement are as follow. Like unnecessary business spending should be cut. As you monitor and strategize, stay focused on identifying additional ways to reduce your cost structure and break even point. Be clear about the distinction between needs and wants and take appropriate step to prioritize the need and set aside the wants. It takes a look at which bills and commitments such as pay and which one can be reduced, defer or pay in installment. Even if you incur a penalty, you can always negotiate. However, do not execute cost-cutting initiative at the risk of compromising revenue generating capabilities. Review your fixed and variable costs carefully and determine what costs you actually need to run the business. Develop and monitor cost reduction initiatives, such as rationalizing the business expenditure, taking a close look at the headcount and instituting the policy that encourage and rewards, reward the cost saving and conservation. All of these strategies can be easily missed in challenging time, but they do make a difference. They help the management team gain clearer insight into decision where new opportunity and reassure employee and external stakeholder about the way forward. So the third is building relationship with customer and supplier. In time of economy uncertainty, businesses could see increased pressure on the purchasing power and creditworthiness 
of customer while also facing tighter credit terms and product availability from supplier. If you maintain friendly, regular communication with your supplier and customer, you will have a better chance of landing a better terms with them. Learning to master the art of negotiation to build a good relationship is an essential part of doing business and could help you convince your supplier to offer you a better deal. And allowing to benefit from cost cutting, cost saving, and improve your cash flow position. And you could come into an agreement with your supplier by offering an early payment if they are willing to give you a discount in return. So negotiate for the most favorable credit terms with supplier and critically evaluate your supplier base to determine if your current agreement is still the most favorable for your business. Likewise, you could offer your customers certain discount to incentivize them to pay earlier, re-evaluate credit terms with current customer, negotiate the shortest reasonable terms, and carefully review the creditworthiness of each new customer before extending credit, Continuously monitor account as failing to collect receivable timely may result in a cash flow issue that could have an immediate impact on all areas of your business. So strong relationship form will be especially useful now during the economy downturns caused by the COVID-19 where the customer and supplier can help each other out by offering each other some incentive to tide over this tough time together. So the fourth is to maximize the COVID-19 stimulus package and government assistance. To ease the cash flow, businesses can tap on the stimulus package and assistance provided by the government. This is the time to maximize the government grant, credits, and other financial or worker support opportunity for your business. It is important to note that government support may differ based on the jurisdiction and sector. In Singapore context, our government has made available many avenues of assistance in terms of rental relief, wages support, grants, and financial assistance, which I'm going to share more in coming slides. So to better manage the rental cost, in Singapore, businesses are able to obtain one to four months of rental waiver, depending on the property type in the Singapore, as you can see in the table, whether it's a shop lot or it's a commercial buildings or office. So next, depending on the industry, employers who retain their local worker get to receive a wages support in the range of 10% to 75%, offset for the first 4,600 of monthly wages for all the local workers. So up till March 2021, under the job support scheme, as you can see in the table. So other wages support scheme include 80% of core funding to the company offer traineeship opportunity under the SG United Traineeship Program. As well as recently announced the Job Grow Incentive Program, which as a further measure to support the firm and worker amid a COVID-19 crisis. Firm that hire local workers over the next six months will receive a subsidy of up to 25% of their salary for one year period, subject to a cap and qualifying criteria. And there will be co-payment up to 50% if you hire a worker age 40 and above. So it's a huge cost saving for the company for higher staff now. Besides, you can tap on the PSG grant for digital transformation so your business can be more resilient in the combating the COVID-19 pandemic. The PSG provides up to 80% funding support for company keen on digitalization and productivity upgrading efforts and remote working online collaboration tools, virtual meeting solution, laptop, are some of the eligible examples that business have to spend on and facilitate work from home arrangement as part of the COVID-19 business continuity measures. Other eligible business expenditure for PSG also include like e-commerce website development, inventory management system. Having government funding definitely help to ease the financial burden on the business. Besides, there's an absentee payroll funding. It's a grant to help employers defray the manpower costs incurred when they send their employee for certifiable skill training during the working hours. So for organizations sponsor their local employees for training, the government will fund their employee salary while he or she is undergoing a training. And for SME businesses requiring financial assistance, there are government support business loan schemes with the government reshare up to 90% in 
and such as SME working capital loan and temporary bridging loan. So if you're interested, you can look for most of the local bank or the local bank in Singapore is supporting for this. So it is essential for the businesses to be aware of the government support and funding program available to strengthen the cash flow and better navigate the ongoing COVID-19 crisis. So company will need to identify and understand each offer of support to determine which one are best suit for their organization. So of course, today the time is limited. I can't, uh, Malaysia also there's quite a lot of grants as well. If you're interested, uh, you can subscribe to our e-newsletter uh, by scanning the QR code in the screen. If you're interested for the Malaysia, uh, you can also visit our website in the Malaysia, www.3cpn.com.my to subscribe to the e-newsletter. So to keep yourself updated for all the latest government grants available. So you can scan if you're interested to subscribe to our billing list. So we'll keep it updated any new government grant come up. So number five is inventory review. So the impact of the COVID-19 has been felt throughout supply chain worldwide. With a production slowdown and facing an uncertainty future, it is essential to manage existing inventory in the short and long term. Inventory management has become more critical to manufacturing and distribution companies. During regular inventory check have never been more important now due to the economy downturn caused by COVID-19. An inventory management system would be ideal. Businesses should always aim to do their regular inventory check. Keeping in mind that the economy downturn might cause some businesses such as their supplier to be facing risk of supply chain disruption, shipping delay, materials shortage, and ultimately some product not being able to deliver on time. Therefore, businesses should try to keep in close communication with their supplier to know which materials would be able to replenish and which item that might not be able to do be purchased at the moment. And the better businesses are able to track their inventory during this time of potential shortage and the more strategy that can be about the inventory assignment to specific job. Furthermore, businesses should start to review slow moving inventory, having excess product on hand Consume working capital and slow moving inventory present a liquidity risk to the companies. So inventory procurement should be a critical component of your company budget and forecasting activities. Inventory level should be compared to the real-time sales data and sales forecast to help identify problem. Inventory before is grids to the hall. So one of the ways this can be accomplished is by monitoring the inventory turnover rate by item. Doing this on a monthly basis will allow key decision makers to spot negative trends and take action before the inventory becomes slow moving. So to summarize it, there are some of the steps you can start to do. Details a list of stakeholder impact by the cash flow issue, including shareholder, lenders, customer, supplier, and employee. Make use of funding and liquidity products and engage early with finance provider to address any forecast deficiency. Explore alternative funding option with the investor or lenders like Cambridge and One Exchange offer viable option of fundraising and private listing. Set up an agreed action plan for each stakeholder. Seek better terms from the customer and supplier whenever possible and deliver your plan monitoring and managing the situation. So cash flow management is not just a finance issue. It's an operational issue. Hence, cash flow management should focus on budgeting, forecasting, financing, and indicate how to handle day-to-day -day activities such as collection, procurement, ordering, and payment. Cash flow should be seen as the lifeblood of all businesses. It is essential to forecast what is going to happen to cash flow to make sure the business has enough to survive. It is important to understand that a company profit at the end of giving month and does not necessarily mean that the company has cash coming into the business. If you don't manage and forecast your cash flow, it makes it almost impossible to make informed business decisions, plan for change, and know how you can enable business growth. So COVID-19 and the related shock to the global economy have caused a major cash flow challenge for businesses. This changing environment calls for more time and dedication of managing cash and taking effective measures to sustain the business. So as conclusion, when dealing with pandemic, we should always plan for the worst and hope for the best. And may we emerge from this pandemic stronger than before. 
So Trade Accounting is proud to be a strategic partner of Cambridge Financial, comprising of Cambridge and One Exchange. So Cambridge Financial can provide a holistic fundraising and liquidity solution depending on your needs, which they are going to share more information with you later. Bye, happy. So do consider private listing for your liquidity needs. If you are new in the private listing, these are some of the advantages. Liquidity while staying private, greater flexibility compared to IPO, lower cost compliance requirement than an IPO, which listing fees at only 5,000 per year. Shorter time required than a normal IPO, it just takes about one to two months to complete. And you get a global investor outreach is available through the blockchain network. So at three accounting, we can assist the company to onboard the Cambridge financial platform for their fundraising and private listing needs. And this is an overview of our professional fees. So today, if you engage our corporate sector service for two companies in Singapore, we will be happy to have the listing readiness assessment done for free for you. So with that, I'm come to the end of my sharing section. So I will hand over to my the time to high ping. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Lawrence, for the very uh, interesting presentation. I think it's very uh, timely given uh, that many uh, companies in Singapore and the region are struggling right now. And of course, uh, as, as you say, you know, cash is the life of the company. You do need to manage this uh, and, and keep watch of this very uh, very tightly in order to make sure that your company still uh, remains afloat and is growing well. Um, so uh, shifting lit, lit, little gears a little bit. So on my side, I'll cover more on the uh, on the financing side and more of the access to, to capital side. Um, so I'd like to share uh, more about what are the traditional uh, fundraising considerations, what are the traditional uh, options. Um, as well as share more of the, uh, the new options and which they include digital platforms as well as private exchanges uh, and how you can be part of the, the new way of uh, fundraising and getting liquidity. So without further ado, um, maybe let's jump straight in, into it. And, uh, and again, if anyone have any questions, feel free to type in the chat uh, and we can address it uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, so I hope everyone can, can see my screen. Um, so there are to my presentation, basically I'll cover an introduction about my company first, uh, followed by an overview of the various uh, fundraising options, uh, introducing the new option which includes uh, private listing as well as digital platforms, uh, ending off with the process and also the next next steps. Um, a little bit about, about myself, uh, so myself I've spent uh, 12 years in uh, private uh, capital markets as well as venture capital. Uh, I've been in the startup and uh, private equity space my whole career. We started over 10 companies and uh, we saw uh, over three IPOs. Uh, and we were responsible in uh, you know, starting the company, hiring, operating, fundraising. Um, so we've actually learned a lot over you know, how to grow companies from zero to IPO. Uh, we've struggled a lot in you know, how can we uh, fundraise for companies and how do we IPO companies. Uh, we actually see a lot of uh, inefficiencies and a lot of um, issues in the and in the way it's currently right now uh, being run, uh, and that's also why we started you know um, our, our solution together with the Singapore Exchange in order to help uh, other companies who are looking to find ways or looking to exit. Uh, hopefully, can we can enable them to have a smoother and, and a smoother smoother journey. Um, so we do have uh, two entities under the group. Uh, we have CapBridge on the left-hand side, uh, which is a, a fundraising platform. It's a digital investment platform. Uh, you can think of it as similar to a crowdfunding platform where we help companies uh, fundraise digitally. So it's a more efficient way to uh, get financing. Uh, and then on the right, we have the One Exchange, is a private exchange. Um, you can think of it as an a easier, more cost-effective way for you to get your company listed as well as uh, having some of your company shares being traded and providing liquidity for your shareholders or even for yourselves. So for CapBridge, uh, we tend to work with uh, private SMEs, uh, venture-backed uh, startups. Uh, we also tend to work pre-IPO companies. So we do have a digital platform. We have uh, thousands of uh, investors, including individual investors and uh, credit investors. Uh, typically, we help companies fundraise from five to $20 million. Uh, and investors come from all over the world. And our job really is to uh, KYC these investors, 
uh, to match them with the right deal and make sure that the uh, the closing journey or the closing process for this um, this companies is smooth. Uh, we also uh, hope to work. We also want to work with 3E uh, in order to make sure that we have a combined package in order to help companies who are looking to fundraise. Uh, if you need help on certain uh, advisory or, or, or materials, we can we can we come up with a package solution as what Lauren shared earlier. The other entity is uh, one exchange. One exchange is like in Singapore, and in Singapore, um, of course, you have the Singapore Exchange, you have main board, uh, you have Catalyst for the growth companies. Uh, but uh, as many of you may know, the cost uh, to to IPO and is is very high. So we are trying to do a, a lower cost, a more flexible way for uh, creative investors or qualified investors to participate. At the same time, enable liquidity for for companies. And I'll, I'll drop more into this uh, in the next section. Um, these are some of the, uh, the media coverage. So we've, we've been widely covered uh, by most of the media channels, as well as having uh, SGX being an uh, investor in both of our entities. Uh, Hanma, one of the largest banks in uh, Korea, Cyberport, uh, and AMPD, one of the largest investment banks uh, in, in Hong Kong and in this part of the world. So moving on to Fundraising. Um, I think fundraising is a topic which, if you are a business owner, if you are a executive, uh, if you are in any company, be it an SME or startup or uh, MNC, um, it's something that you cannot ignore. So we can see from the graph uh, or, the, or the diagram from the left hand side is that uh, typically there are different stages of fundraising. Uh, and there's also different types of fundraising. There's the private fundraising and then it's the public fundraising. Uh, but I think this composition is even important, is even more important to have now rather than, than not. Uh, because of the global situation, many companies are facing a, a struggle to, to maintain their cash flow, to oper to make efficient their operations and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, somehow or rather, I think uh, companies will have to explore uh, defined raising compensation uh, where they are either issuing new shares or they are selling existing shares to uh, other stakeholders or other investors. So fundraising is a, is a key activity. Uh, typically, when you need to fundraise is to raise capital to have greater cash flow. Uh, in SMEs, we see a lot of move to become more digital and to become more efficient. And sometimes you need to fundraise uh, if, if for it. I mean, obviously, if you want to you know, change your business model, you want to be more COVID resilient, you want to uh, integrate your, your e-commerce platform and so on and so forth to greater resiliency, often you also need to fundraise. Uh, that's the main reason is to really raise capital in order for a company to survive and for a company to grow. Um, the second reason why most companies fundraise is really to convert uh, their stakeholders into shareholders and to better align them. Um, so we've seen many situations where you know a company, a B2C company, have many uh, users. Uh, they have a large user base. Uh, and what they can do is that uh, they can then offer their shares uh, through a platform like us into the user base. And once the user base are, and then customers are shareholders, they'll actually be more loyal, you know, because uh, they, they are investors in their in your company, they are shares in your company, and therefore they are more aligned in a sense. So it's similar to, you know, buying a share on, uh, on uh, let's say, SGX into Singtel, uh, while having Singtel as, 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 uh, as, a, as your mobile subscriber. To the, to the consumer, it's, you, you have more loyalty to, to the company because now not only are you, a uh, customer, you are also a shareholder, which includes, which increases your switching costs. The other reason why uh, companies want to fundraise is because, you know, many times they have already exhausted um, their loan ratio. So there is a limit to what banks can borrow, borrow to you. Uh, and so what happens when that, that ratio is being met is that the company often have to either inject more pay in capital. Uh, but as we know, sometimes it's very difficult for founders to uh, invest capital themselves. They may be too uh, focused on one area. Maybe their whole life asset is in one company and it's very difficult for them to diversify. So they may then invite other shareholders or other company owners to come and participate uh, in the company in order to have greater loans. Uh, obviously, we also see a lot of companies looking to compete with the industry. So uh, as we see the competition increase across the board, uh, as, especially when demand drop, uh, more companies are uh, undergoing fundraising. They are trying to have uh, very brand name investors in order to raise the confidence of the customers and also in order to raise their profile. 
Um, lastly, we also see fundraising as a means for an eventual, eventual exit. So whenever a company, you know, fundraisers from, let's say, you know, uh, Temasek or from a very, very large PE firm, most of the time they are leveraging on those stakeholders for them to eventually be sold or be go into IPO later on. Uh, and in parallel to a fundraise, uh, most business owners are also looking to liquidate their own uh, uh, assets. So in other words, if I have a company I'm raising $10 million, sometimes during the process itself, you know, if you are the business owner of the company, you have actually been, been in the company for, for many years, 10 to 15 years, uh, and maybe you have seen your company grow from zero to 50 to $100 million, uh, you may want to you know, take one or $2 million shares in order to sell them on the exchange or, or, or to the new coming investor, you know, for you to pay for your own life events. So there are many, many reasons why company fundraise, but I think by and large, most companies, uh, early stage, SME, late stage, they do have, they do need to have this conversation uh, sooner or later. We also want to distinguish the two types of fundraising. Um, one is the private fundraising where they raise money from private investors, including the, the we call it private equity and venture capital firms. Uh, and then there's the public fundraise in which um, they undergo what we call IPO or initial public offering. Uh, and then they can actually reach out to retail investors. So the biggest distinction is that in a public fundraising, you can reach out to retail investors, uh, but because you are reaching out to retail investors, the bar is very, very high, and therefore the cost is also very, very high. Um, the second most definitive uh, characteristic is that in a public fundraise, there's an ability for existing shareholders to buy and sell their shares when they are coming undergo an IPO. So for example, if you are a business owner today, if you raise money privately, typically it's very tough for you to sell uh, your shares uh, and also to, to, to get some money out of it to monetize your illiquid shares. However, that's also the main reason why most people want to go for a public IPO. Uh, they pay the hefty cost and price in order to have the ability to sell their shares. So no point growing a company from zero to 100 to 200 million if you can't even sell your shares and maybe get a little bit of money for, for yourselves. Um, depending on the type of fundraising, there's also uh, other key considerations. So whether they want to raise privately, whether they want to uh, do an IPO and raise publicly really depends on uh, a lot of factors. And these are some of the key considerations. Uh, most of the time as a business owner, uh, you want to have the largest possible uh, investor base. And typically if you raise money during an IPO process, then you have, the, you have a larger investor base. This is very important because if you are unable to reach out to many investors, uh, it will mean that your demand for your shares is very low. And when the demand for your shares is very low, it's very tough to have a market price or it's very tough to have a fair price for your company. Let's say in a stream case, you only have one investor willing to invest in your company. Uh, basically in Chinese, we say which means that it can be at any price and the price is totally solely determined by the, uh, the sole investor. If you have many investors, you know, 5, 10, 100, 500, then it, 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 it allows you to have a, a more market-like uh, uh, way to price the shares and to make sure that the shares pricing is fair on both sides. The second consideration is liquidity. Um, so for startups and SMEs in their first, second, third year, um, it's not so much of an issue, but if you're a company owner, you have already been, been uh, growing your company, uh, typically, we see you know at the fifth year mark, uh, more and more angel investors, VCs, PEs will ask the, the founding team and the majority of the you know how can I sell? Uh, when are you going to IPO? How can I get back my shares? I've seen my I've seen my 100k investment become 200k, 20k investment. When can I get out? So if this is the main consideration, uh, typically you have to go for what we call a public listing or a private listing, which I'll introduce you uh, shortly. I think the last three factors are also very important. Um, you also don't want to uh, give away the whole company when you're raising financing. So sometimes uh, when I've seen very horror stories when the SMEs, they raise money from certain PEVCs, uh, they came with a whole list of reserve matters that they can't do. They can't raise a salary, they can't go on vacation, they can't, they have, they can't do liquidation preference. And you have those nightmare scenario where you have a PEVC investor that's overly restrictive then you essentially lost control of your company already, even though you may have uh, the majority number of shares. Uh, maybe some of the examples are that you can't raise money from anyone else unless you have the approval from this investor. And the investor says, no, you are basically stuck. 
And of course, cost and time is a huge consideration. In a typical IPO, it costs anywhere from one to two million dollars. Uh, it costs anywhere from 100 to 200K to remain listed. So the cost is very high. Uh, and that's why most companies want to do private fundraising. But again, private fundraising comes with cost too. They typically charge five to 10% uh, to a banker. And also the fundraising is very uncertain. And then we, we talk about time. Obviously, you want to uh, spend as little time and as effort as possible to uh, run your company. Uh, by IPOs, you know, this may take anywhere from 18 to hours of 24 to 36 months. And of course, private fundraising is, is, is anyone's um, guess. So basically, uh, just to quickly summarize, right, the, the common options that, that we see or uh, that what we have seen while, while we were helping our, our own portfolio fundraise and helping our own companies IPO is that there's no one perfect solution. Either you do a private fundraise and you are really beholden to the investor, the private equity and VC investor, you have no liquidity. Uh, either that, you bite the bullet and you go for IPO. You go, you go to a public fundraise, but you have to pay millions of dollars and hundreds of K in the meeting of listing. Um, so, so basically both, both options are not optimal for private companies. Um, so what we have actually thought to do is to create a new option, what we call private listing. And that's really what uh, us at One Exchange really believes to help companies in this situation. So what we do very differently from an, an IPO is that the whole process of a private listing is very, very similar to IPO. Uh, we do create a, a listing uh, where uh, part of a company is actually floated and have their shares traded for liquidity, uh, but we don't do all the way. So in a public fundraising in the middle, you will see that 100% um, of the company is actually being listed. And that's also where a lot of costs uh, come in. Uh, what we do very differently is that we allow, you know, 70 to 90% of the company to, to remain private and to remain as is. So whatever shares and whatever shareholding structure all remains uh, intact. All we do is that we create a new structure, we call it a special purpose vehicle or, or SPV um, to hold 10 to 30% of the company. So you can imagine this to be a new investor uh, is coming in, it's either being issued new shares or having uh, existing shareholders sell their shares to it. And it's not a company that has its shares traded, it is actually the SPV that we created that have its shares traded. So in this way, we are able to reduce cost um, we're able to create uh, global access and global liquidity while allowing, allowing the company to remain uh, more or less private. So this is a new innovation that we have designed, mainly because we have seen that um, in the existing uh, ecosystem as it is today, there isn't a, a one-size-fits-all solution. So this solution is more for companies that are either unwilling to go for a full IPO or they're too early for IPO, uh, yet they are looking for global access to investors. They are looking for liquidity. Uh, this private listing is actually one option for them. Um, we also think that now is a great time to explore this option because I think the world is growing more and more digital. Uh, COVID has reduced the ability to do face-to-face -face, uh, interactions and 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and processes. So uh, for ourselves. Uh, truthfully speaking, COVID hasn't impacted our service, services that much because we are a fully digital platform. Uh, and we do know that investors are actually looking for the cheap now. So they are looking for good companies and good valuation to, to invest in. I think during the sell down, many of their public shareholdings have actually been, uh, have, have faced a huge hit. So a lot of them are looking to start uh, looking for private companies in order to help diversify their, their portfolio. Um, so I think in terms of what investors are looking out for, um, they have been uh, invested in the public markets, but they are also looking into private companies in order to help diversify their portfolio. So looking into where we see how all this plays a big role, um, we at, at One Exchange actually don't see ourselves as a competitor to uh, SGX. Obviously, SGX is also our shareholder, uh, but we actually work them very closely in order to create a pipeline for them. So in terms of sequence, right, we will actually advise companies to think of a private listing as a way to prepare or as a way to be before a public listing. So I think when, for those of you who have done a public listing, it's actually a very time consuming process. It's very expensive. Um, the bar is very high. 
is a very uh, binary bar where suddenly you are a private company and suddenly you are a public company where you have to go through all the, um, the compliance costs, the corporate governance, the announcement and reporting. It is a lot of work. So what we try to do is that we want to enable a phased approach where we only allow uh, 10 to 30 percent of the company to remain uh, listed and tradable first, not the full company. So this allows the companies to practice how to be a public company. This allows the company to practice how to make announcements, how to do what we call investor relations. Um, if they if the company isn't structured and the company don't have the support of uh, 3E and other professional services firms to help them in this, even if they go for a full IPO, um, it's unlikely that they will see any liquidity, which is what they actually want. They actually want to see liquidity and active trading on their company. Um, so what we try to do is that we want to enable a phased approach where companies can do a private listing first. At the same time, we want to work with uh, players like Tree and others in order to support the company, train them, make sure that they understand what is involved in being a listing and what is it involved in uh, providing updates and reports to investors. So as a quick summary, um, we do see investors looking to invest in private securities, especially since the big uh, hit from public uh, markets during COVID. Uh, we do see investors, more and more investors, especially in Singapore, more interested to, pray, to trade in private uh, companies. Uh, and we do see the interest from them to trade in and out and to rebalance their portfolio. Uh, for companies, we do see the value in uh, doing what we call a, a private listing, where it's a more cost-effective, a more flexible way to IPO, at the same time not break the bank, um, but also to increase your cash flow and to build more resiliency while having more shareholders and, and align your stakeholders. Uh, we do allow uh, a couple of options for, for listing on one exchange. So we do have two options and uh, which option you choose depending on uh, which on, 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 on what is your specific needs. So for companies who do not need to fundraise, you know, they are simply looking to list their shares. You know, maybe they have um, 50 shareholders and some of the shareholders want to buy more shares, some of the shareholders want to sell more shares, uh, and they have no need to fundraise at all. Uh, what we can do is that we can do what we call a direct listing, uh, where we are, we are taking, you know, 30% of the company and we're simply converting the shareholdings of the 30% into a float that is listed and tradable on our exchange. Um, so the process is very straightforward. It can be done in one or two months. Uh, and it's really to help companies who are looking for liquidity, but not necessarily looking to fundraise. Uh, we also know that obviously some companies need to fundraise. So for that, we have uh, option B, which is an integrated uh, listing, where they actually issue new uh, funds first, and then they have their shares listed on one exchange. This will obviously take a longer time because uh, they will need to educate the investors and go through different roadshows and events. Uh, and of course, the fees are higher, but uh, it, it, it will, on the, on the grand scale of things, it will still be way lower than that of a traditional IPO. But I think uh, what is most efficient is to go through uh, case studies. So this is a Malaysian company, it's called uh, Danai Spa. Um, so actually, uh, they were looking to do a direct listing uh, since April and uh, by July, we have actually uh, helped them do a direct listing uh, and uh, we actually helped them float or uh, we helped them list and trade $2 million of worth of Singapore shares. Um, so it is very interesting because uh, it's a direct listing. They will have over 70 investors. Some shareholders uh, have want to buy more shares. Some shareholders want to sell more shares. Uh, the company also want to actually get more investors who will then be more loyal to, to Danai Spa. Uh, and that's also why they wanted to raise their profile and to give confidence to their to to their their consumers that uh, their company is resilient. So they're also using this as a marketing uh, tool and a marketing outreach to to give confidence to um, the, the 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 various uh, spa operators in in Malaysia to say that okay now we're listed we have a higher bar we are compliant uh, with all these shareholders our cap our 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 market cap is this much as opposed to other players in the market who is entire private company and they have no outreach to, to ability to investors. And of course, this can also help their visibility. Um, so uh, we did a virtual uh, striking ceremony. This was done a couple of months back. And, uh, you know, testament to COVID, everything was done entirely uh, online. 
and uh, we yet we can still get the 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 company listed and the shares are actually actively traded. Uh, and of course, the the cost is for for this company is 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 not as high as that as a typical IPO. The other company we help to list um, is actually a fundraise and a listing. So this in this case, they actually raised five point six million dollars through our platform Capbridge. Uh, they then actually listed another two million dollars from the founders. So the founders managed to list and trade some of their shares. Um, and so there's a total of 7.6 million traded uh, on, on the platform. And since then, we've actually seen quite a lot of uh, trades already being done on the exchange. So for them, this company wants to uh, IPO in the long run, uh, but they see us as a stepping stone and a phase approach for them to do an eventual listing. So uh, they have done, they have done, they have done pretty well. They have seen uh, quite a lot of uh, trades already being done. Uh, and also um, they have uh, used our platform to make announcements to the investor base. So this is a ceremony that we did uh, in the SGX venue itself. So I think all in all, just to summarize, right, I think private companies have, you know, fundraising needs, they have uh, liquidity needs. Um, traditionally, they can only do, you know, uh, IPO or they can only raise money from a very small group of selected investors. Uh, what we try to do is that we try to change the game. We try to make it more accessible. We try to make it more digital. Um, so through a private listing, companies can remain private, uh, yet still have liquidity uh, through the SPV structure as mentioned. So when you have more liquidity, actually more investors are interested because they can actually buy and sell shares instead of just buying their shares and waiting and hope until you IPO. Um, obviously, the cost is lower and uh, uh, then IPO and obviously it's more flexible than IPO. Uh, it's a shorter time as well as the ability to outreach to global investors. Um, in terms of the process, if it's a direct listing, it's a one or two months. And in terms of the, uh, the if it's a fundraising, uh, normally we want, want to work with, uh, with uh, entities like, like 3E in order to help make sure that um, all your documentation is in place, your business plans, your financial, model, um, your valuation report uh, is in a way that is easily consumed uh, by investors. So if you do need to find ways, um, there is more effort and time required, but I think uh, professionals are available to, to help prepare your package in order for it to be uploaded on to our digital investment platform for, for, for outreach. And once that is done, one exchange is also ready to help with your company and enable for, for trading. So with that, uh, I think that's a very quick touch on the criteria. So we are looking for companies with at least two years of operating history, uh, working capital at least 12 months. And uh, this is an all criteria. So they either have raised 4 million capital or they have 2 million revenue. So basically we are trying to exclude startups. We are trying to include companies which are looking to, uh, which have more or less revenue positive or have capital um, so that we want to reduce the risk to investors. Um, so with that, you know, I end I end my talk, and uh, I'll now hand over the floor to uh, to to Wise, who help who now help to organize the, the questions, the Q and A. Thank you, Hai Bing. Very insightful sharing. I apologize. We are running a bit short on time. We are running over time. Perhaps just one question to Lawrence. Lawrence, many businesses are actually affected by the pandemic. What are some of the cost cutting initiative that business owners can consider? without compromising revenue generating activities? Oh, okay, these are good questions. So of course, some of the cost cutting, the businesses can take like refinance their loan because now with the government support like bridging loan, the interest rate can be very low, like one to 2%. And then you can also consider renegotiate your agreement with a better terms, like the tenancy agreement. If you're going to expire, you renew now, you definitely can get a rental dropping will be like 10 to 20% and it's a long-term saving for you as well. And as, as well as you can tell, a lot of government grants for hiring staff, it's also reduced a lot of your salary costs as well. So of course, cash flow forecasting is definitely very important to identify what costs can be cut and how to cut. And you always engage to your accountant and definitely the accountant can help you always. Thank you, thank you Lawrence. Okay, thank you all. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of the webinar. Our speakers would love to connect with you via LinkedIn or email. Our contact details together with the slides and recording will be sent to you via email shortly. Feel free to contact us or follow us on our social media. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.
Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.